Morning, all. Uh, this is fair warning. In the early service, I went 15 minutes past the time I was supposed to be done and didn't even realize it. Yeah, I mean, I, I just kept talking. And, and Mark cut off my mic there. <laughs> so I hope that doesn't happen in this service. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. As I was talking to Joe, we got we to gotta let the spirit move sometimes. Uh, to begin, though, I want to call your attention to the back of the bulletin where there are some announcements. I do want to encourage you to come tonight to the hymn sing at Boise Valley Church. Um, so there's an opportunity that people have. We can come together as a district, the different churches, the different congregations in the district, to lift our voices in song and to praise God and to be in each other's company. And there will be a meal involved. It's a light meal. So after we finish singing, you don't want to eat before you sing. You want to eat after you sing. So we'll sing first and then, uh, and then join together in song. That is tonight, uh, this, this afternoon, 4 o'clock is when it starts at Boise Valley Church. Uh, the address is printed there. It's the corner of Star and McMillan, right? Yeah. So uh, come to that tonight. Uh, moving forward in time, let you know again about the district conference. That's on the 11th and the 12th. Everyone is invited to that. We're going to have some good worship and some good speakers. So come if you're able to do that and, be, and participate in that. And then uh, down here on the bottom, there's something. I don't know, something that's happening. Pat's rolling her eyes at me. If Pat has not already contacted you to help with the bazaar, um, then I don't know, maybe you're dodging her calls. Um, because uh, this is all hands on deck for this really vital outreach to the community um, it's an opportunity to be, again, in each other's company, sharing God's love with the, with the neighborhood, and uh, it's, it is a good time. So that's coming up on the 26th of October. So we want to invite you to put that on your calendar. Do not miss it uh, at all. Just be there. Okay? You good? All right. That's the announcements that I have. It is good to be with you this morning. That's the, the informal welcome that you'll get. Mark is going to give you your formal welcome when he comes and opens our service. Mark, if you would begin our time. Good morning. And it's a nice fall day. Uh, outside of me distilling mint, so my st stuffy head. It, it's spearmint, not peppermint, so I don't get the menthol, which cleans your sinuses, so it's yeah, stuff. So anyway, to start out with, I'm, I'm going to read uh, Psalms 150. Praise the Lord. Praise him in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to su his suppress, su surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that breezes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And it's interesting that Evidently, he doesn't want you to be quiet about it. No. <laughs> so, um, if you will uh, join me in uh, opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to come together and praise you and make joyful noise to you. And may you open our hearts and our minds as we hear your words and open them to the understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For the scripture reading, it's Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let the love be genuine. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but be uh, ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Pre preserve in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will pay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Good morning. Please stand. Oh, worship the King. i 
For the offertory, I'll be reading from Mark 12, verses 41 through 44. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small, small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. If you would please stand and join in, in singing with me. to invite the kids to come forward. Hi, Nancy. Good to see you. Come on. Find a seat. You can sit on the floor, on the step, wherever you'd like to sit. Do you need, do you need somebody to come up with you? <laughs> it's okay, either way. Good morning. So we're going we're gonna to try something. It's something you do with your ears, and then I'm going to tell you a little story after that, okay? You ready for that? Okay, so this is going to be kind of loud, and so if you have sensitive hearing, notice I'm talking to you all and not them, but if you have sensitive hearing, you can cover your ears if you need to, okay? All right, so go ahead and play that. It sounds a little like a waterfall. That's actually sounds of a hurricane where there's a lot of water falling. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Now, was that easy for you to hear what I was telling you while, while that sound was going? Yeah, you couldn't even hear what I was saying. Well, this relates to a story from the Bible. I'm going to tell you about a guy named Elijah. Okay, Elijah was a prophet, which means that God told him special things that he needed to tell the people. And some of the stuff he already knew and just had to repeat it to them. And his message was that they needed to worship God because the people were not worshiping God. They were doing all kinds of stuff that they shouldn't be doing. And the problem was, was that the people were not listening to Elijah. They kept doing the stuff that they shouldn't have been doing. And Elijah finally got to the point where he's like, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. 
And the story goes that he ran into the desert to get away from people that wanted to kill him. And he kept going into the desert until God said, I want you to go to this mountain, Mount Horeb. You don't have to remember what mountain it was, but it was a mountain. And he went up on the mountain waiting to hear what God was going to tell him. And this is the story. And God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, like that, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So, did Elijah hear God in the big wind? No. Did Elijah hear God in the earthquake? Did Elijah hear God in the fire? What did, had to happen for Elijah to hear God? Quietness. It had to get quiet. Now, you guys might not go to a mountain and have a big wind and an earthquake and fire, but is there a lot of noise in your life? Are there things that distract you? Yeah. Like your siblings or your cousins or people around you at school or sometimes just stuff that you just don't even really want to pay attention to? It distracts you? Is it easy to hear God when all that stuff's happening? Sometimes we just need to have a little quiet. Because God is always trying to tell you things. And if we can quiet our hearts, sometimes we can hear Him better. And what God is telling you is the same thing that he told Elijah. Be faithful to me. Can you guys do that? I hope that you can hear that in your hearts. Let's pray together, okay? Lord, we know that sometimes the world is full of noise. Sometimes it's literal noise, like hurricanes and stuff. And other times it's just distractions. Things on TV, things we hear on the radio, the people around us. And we can get distracted and not hear you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us all, whether we're young or old, to settle our hearts and to get quiet so that we can hear you more clearly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go. She wants you to go with her, too. She's pretty cute. Please stand, if you're able. Blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress.
part of me wants to reread what Mark read out of the Romans passage this morning simply because it's so critical to what we're thinking about today. It is the way that we are meant to live. It's the behavior that we are meant to exhibit. And so I won't read it. You can just kind of keep it in front of you. But that does begin in that 12th chapter to talk about this idea of being something different than what we were before. He begins that 12th chapter of Romans saying that we are to be not conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This is the theme. And then he goes on, and what Mark read was, this is what that looks like. And that's where we are right now. We're going to take a little bit out of his letter, Paul's letter to the Colossians as well. It basically tells us the same thing. This is how you were meant to live. This is what it looks like for you to have a transformed life. So beginning in the 12th verse of the third chapter of Paul's letter to the Colossians, he tells the church there, he tells the church here, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Tosh and I spent the last 18 years with an aspiring engineer in the house. When Cyrus was just a toddler, he, we had a set of gears. They had magnets on the back of them so you could stick them on the refrigerator and move them around and arrange them in different ways. And one of them had a motor. You could turn it on. And if you just set the gears up, and it would just turn everything and create this little mechanism on the refrigerator. But that wasn't enough for Cyrus. So he found a string of beads that the beads were just the right size to mesh in the cogs of these little plastic gears. And so he was not content to have one gear driving another. He had to have a whole system on the refrigerator that we could turn on and it would just do its thing. And it was kind of took over the kitchen for a little while, actually. But that's what it is. This are his, his childhood, our life as a childhood, young adulthood. It's been a succession of gears and towers and marble runs and countless Lego kits and then office appliances and junk cars and stuff. It's piled up around us. Now, one of the things that these aspiring engineers seem to do is take things apart. That's part of the deal, is you take things apart. Perhaps it's an essential part of the process when it comes to learning how things work to take them apart. The problem is, and you know where I'm going, very rarely do things go back together. Now that's fine if this thing that you've been taking apart is broken already in some way. It doesn't work. It's just there. Yeah, find out what's inside. Take it apart. But when perfectly functional things are disassembled and then not reassembled, it gets a little frustrating. You end up with boxes and boxes of parts and pieces to something that could possibly be functional if it were just put back together. And so you, you can't just throw it out. Even though you want to, you can't because it has the potential to work. But who knows if it's ever going to be whole again. So I'm sitting at my desk yesterday and I'm writing this message and I'm looking across to the other side of the room at all of the boxes and the piles of dismantled stuff that Cyrus has so kindly left for his mother and I now that he's gone off to college and I couldn't help but think about the way that things really are more functional when they are fully assembled. When they are a whole thing instead of a box of pieces. 
Each individual piece in the box might be fully functional in itself, but without it being a part of the whole, then that piece can never really fully be what it was meant to be. And this is just as true for us as human creatures as it is for all of the various items that have been disassembled in our household over the years. We've been taking this journey through this process over the last couple of months, this process, this concept of Christian spiritual formation. And we've taken it apart, so to speak. We've disassembled the human creature to look at the various components, the different dimensions of who we are as a human. We want we know that God wants to transform each of those parts into something that is more reflective of who Jesus is. We've talked about our emotions. We spent a Sunday on that. We talked about our intellect. We talked about our calling, our vocation, our work. We talked about our physical bodies. We even talked about the resources that God has entrusted to us, the different parts that we've examined. We've noted each one in turn. But no matter how well each of these individual dimensions of our lives reflects the likeness of Christ until they are all brought back together, until they are reassembled into a whole, we aren't really going to get where God wants us to go. We'll be a collection of parts without any integration. And so we need to put it all together. That's today. So I've mentioned to you before, for those that have been through this, this uh, series with us, the visual model that's been sort of in the background uh, of our discussion here. Again, it's, this is a model that's been presented to us by Dr. Diane Chandler, her book, Christian Spiritual Formation. That's been sort of a springboard for me as I've thought and reflected about uh, these, this, this topic that we have. And the model, and I've described it before, but I'll do it again, the model is kind of like a flower, uh, picture a sunflower, okay? Um, and the love of God and the image of God, who we are in God's eyes, the center of it is God and God's love. So that's like the, 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 the center of the flower. And then the petals go out from the, that center. And each of the dimensions that we've talked about is one of the petals on the flower. Uh, and each one obviously is influenced by the other. So the, the, the line between them is a little arbitrary, I mean, when you think about our intellect, you can't help but think about our emotions, and that plays into all of the others. And so these things are woven together, and they do influence each other. We just divide them so that we can talk about them a little more easily. The reality is that it is a whole piece that we're talking about. Each petal is connected to the others. And so we've got this center, the center of the flower, which is God's love. And then we've got these petals around the outside that represent all of the different areas, the dimensions of our lives. But the model doesn't end there. There is one more layer, if you want to think of it that way, one more, one more part that we have to talk about. It doesn't stop at the ends of the petals. This is the layer that faces the world. You see, God wants to transform each of these dimensions of our lives, each of these aspects of our lives, uh, so that we can more fully reflect the image of God, the likeness of Christ. And if there were no one to witness that, if there were no one to see that, then it kind of seems pointless, doesn't it? If it was just, you know, doing it and that was the end of it. But we don't have to worry about that because there is always somebody who will witness whether or not we are being transformed into the likeness of Christ. First, obviously, it pleases God. It pleases God when we fully reflect that image of God. So we are transformed for God's glory. But we're also placed in this world. I don't want to shock you, but if you look around the room, you'll notice that you are not here alone. There are people here with you. People that you are in relationship with. And so God has placed us in this relational world where we interact with countless other people, all of whom look at us and think, how well are they reflecting the likeness of Christ? They may not think about it in that language, but that is something, if we profess Christ, that's going to be on, on the table. And that should concern us. We ought to be at least attentive to that. It should concern us. People are watching. 
being transformed, being spiritually formed, it has to play out in the way that we move through this world, in the way that we act in this world. And when we talk about putting all this together, what we're talking about is our ethical living. So, in every aspect of this this process, this transformational process, there is a behavioral component. It doesn't just happen inside, it comes out in how we act. It doesn't do any good to believe that we've been transformed by the Spirit of God in terms of our emotions, say, when we don't actually exhibit Christ-like emotions, right? It doesn't really do us a whole lot of good talking about the transformation of relationships if we don't actually interact with other people in a Christ-like way. If we want to believe that we're good stewards of the resources that God has entrusted to us, then we actually have to be good stewards. I know, you're nodding your head here, right? Okay. It's so simple, so obvious, I kind of struggle to say it. It has to come out in some kind of actions. The proof is in the pudding. Transform lives. Show up in transformed behavior. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's from Jesus, if you're wondering. What's inside us comes out. And so if we are truly committed to becoming what God wants us to be, transformed into the likeness of Christ, then we're going to start showing that. We're going to start living a Christ-like life. And that has to do with all of the dimensions of our lives, every aspect of our lives together as a whole. So we need to remember to back when we started this journey a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, three months ago. We're at the end. It's been three months. We've been talking about this for three months. It's wild, huh? And you don't actually have to remember because I'm going to remind you. I'll tell you what we're talking about. So there were some fundamental principles back when we started this that we still need to have in our heads. One, the whole transformational process, this whole thing that God wants to do in our life begins with God. Okay, I want you to hang on to that truth. It begins with God. It has to begin with God. We're not enough. There's no way that we could initiate anything on our own. God, who loves everything into existence, God has to start this process too. This whole redemptive thing has to originate with God. And we can have faith. We can believe that God has started it. It is in process. And this is the most clear when we look at Jesus. We can see God's redemptive plan lived in Jesus Christ. And so God has already done it. God has started this transformation process. So the second thing that we need to remember is that we need it. I know that probably doesn't come as a shock to anyone. We need this. There are, I haven't run across any perfect people today. You're all good people. But we all have a little bit more that we can do. We need this. We talked early on about how we are always being formed. There's always some influence in our lives that's pressing on us and shaping us. We are a lot more malleable than we like to think. I know as we get older, we're like going, oh boy, you can't teach this old dog new tricks. Yeah, you can. Absolutely. We are squishier than we want to accept. We are being formed. And since we live in this world, which is fallen and which is corrupt, then the influences on us more often malform us than transform us. We're not always around positive influences, folks. Most often they come to us through some electronic device, if we're honest. So there's all sorts of sinful and negative influences that are trying to get us to be what Paul talks about at the beginning of that 12th chapter, to get us to be conformed to this world, to the patterns of this world. And so we all need this, this transforming by God. In initiating the transformation by placing his own image in us, God starts the process, and then we derail it. <laughs> we, 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 we cause problems. We get in the way. We, we clog up the works. We derail it by going after these worldly and sinful patterns that surround us. We chase after them. We're hungry for them. Why? Because the world says you should be hungry for them. 
You should chase that. And so we do. We go after it. We, and that obscures the image of God in us. I don't know if you've seen these videos that come on, on sometimes of, of the kids or the dogs that get in the mud puddle. And they're all mushing around in the mud puddle and the thing comes out and you're like, going, I don't even know what that is. That's a dog, I think, or a kid. I can't tell. It's just mud. That's the image of God in us, folks. We get so much of the world encrusted on us that you can't even see it anymore. And so this is the process that God wants us to go into, to clean the crud off and let that image shine through again. And the power that drives this whole thing, the thing that makes all of this possible, this whole process, is God's love. God's love. This all-powerful and eternal love. Love that never lets us go. This is what started the whole thing in the beginning, is God's love for us. And so these are the fundamental principles, the foundational principles of this formational process. We need it. And because we can't do it ourselves, God does it. God starts the process and sustains the process, and it is his love that makes it all possible. Again, we're right in the core of our model still. So think about God's love. God's love that is poured out and pushed and driven by God himself. Think about that flowing out through all of the various dimensions of our lives. Out through the petals, if you will. All, of our, all the aspects of our human character. Starting in that, that center of love and the love flowing out through these dimensions. And if we can get ourselves out of the way... If we can stop gumming up the works, well, that love is going to find its way out to the outer edge, out to the place where we encounter the world. It'll find its way out to our behavior, the things that we do. So just like this love is at the center, at the core of our spiritual formation, love is also out on the periphery, out on that place where we interact. It, it, it is the very substance of transformed behavior. God's love goes through all of these various parts of who we are and then transforms them into Christ-likeness and then it continues out to where we interact with the world. Think about a transformed intellect, a mind that is really following Jesus, a, a thinking that is formed with God's love. That's going to show up in the world. You can say the same about all the dimensions, all the different aspects. When, when they're transformed by love, then loving behavior results. Again, this, this seems very simple to me. Almost like it should go without saying. But look at the behavior. Look at the behavior of people who claim to be followers of Jesus. Again, nobody here. You're all, you're all wonderful people. But folks out there maybe who say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. Look at the behavior that you see there and ask yourself, is this behavior that is shaped by love? Does it look like love? And I don't want you to jump to a simple answer here. What we think of as love is not necessarily godly love. You see, in God's eyes, love and justice and righteousness, <laughs> they're all woven together. They're part of a single whole, and so a truly love-formed ethic, it might not look entirely like what the world is expecting when it thinks of love. And, before we get too judgy, because I said, look at them, eh, they're just like us in a process. And so there's plenty of room for grace and mercy here. But, the truism is true. The proof is in the pudding. A consistently unloving set of behaviors in any of the dimensions that we've talked about, that may indicate a lack of commitment to this transforming power of the Spirit of God. It's like, yeah, sure, you can, you can take care of this stuff, God, but don't go over there. I don't want you to fix that. I like that the way that it is. Because it gets me stuff I think I want. There's a resistance there. And, again, can't get too judgy because what is true for them is also true for us. So, God loves us. God loves us. I want to see everybody's eyes on that one. God loves us. 
And God is willing to take that love that he has for us and pour it in abundance into our lives so that we can be transformed by that love. And that's going to find its way into our behavior. We just have to get on board with it. We just have to say yes when God says, do you want to be transformed? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be restored? Do you want to be reconciled? And we respond with yes. We've got to get on board, stop being so self-serving. And maybe the best way to think about this would be the same way that Jesus thinks about it. You see, when Jesus was sending his disciples out after he was done with his ministry and he was going to go back to the Father, he commissions them. This is found at the end of Matthew's Gospel. He commissions them. He says, go into all the world and make disciples. He says some more things, but I want to focus on that make disciples phrase. Make disciples. This idea of making disciples is is rich. There's a lot to it. But at its very core, it's an idea that involves being a student, a learner. Those of you who have been in education, you have students. You know this process and what what it's involved with. So who are we to learn from? When Jesus sends his disciples out into the world and tells them to make disciples, who are they to learn from? Obviously, it's Jesus. That's who we're to learn from. Jesus is not telling the disciples to go make disciples of themselves. Go make a disciple of Peter, and then they can make a disciple of them, and on down the road. It's not this this progressive chain. It is the disciples are being told to go out, find people, introduce them to Jesus so that they can become followers of Jesus and be a disciple of Jesus. It's always making disciples of Jesus because Jesus is still with us. So, just Jesus. We get that. But what does it mean to be a disciple? We know who we're learning from, but what does it mean to be a disciple, a learner of Jesus? Well, this might help a little bit. In the first century, the tradition is you had a rabbi, a teacher, somebody who who seemed to know stuff. The process of learning from a rabbi, becoming a disciple of the rabbi, was really simple. There were not textbooks There were not tests. There were not quizzes. You didn't have homework. You didn't have to fill out essays. It was just this. Follow them and copy them. That seems pretty simple, right? Follow them and copy them. What you saw him do, you do that. If he washes his hands before a meal, you wash your hands before a meal. If he takes his hat off when he comes in the building, you take your hat off when he comes in the building. If he shows respect to certain people, you show respect to those people. You get this, right? Just copy him. It's not really formal instruction, although there's part of that. It's just watching and copying, imitating Christ. That's what Paul talks about. I'm imitating Christ. Again, this seems so simple to me that it seems odd to talk about it. it kinda, it's in the realm of an assumption. Yeah, obviously. But maybe, again, in this case, the unspoken needs to be spoken. Because, again, a lot of us as followers of Jesus aren't really following Jesus. We're kind of doing our own thing. We're not a disciple in in the disciple sense of the word. We're following Jesus like we follow the car in front of us on the freeway. It's like there's no relationship there. We just happen to be behind them. They're going the same direction that I feel like I want to go, so I'm following them. And that's not what discipleship is. You see, discipleship has to show up in different behavior that we have learned from the one we are learning from. We copy Jesus. We have to act like Jesus. Oh, so you remember the kids used to wear those rubber bracelets a while back? Maybe you had one. Had those, those letters on it? WWJD, what would Jesus do? I know there were some people that were like, oh, no, how can we ever do what Jesus did? We can't do that kind of, and kind of dismissive of it. But <laughs> that's, it's a great question. It's probably the most important question for a true disciple of Jesus. What would Jesus do? But the question's not enough. Well, you can ask the question, you might even get an answer. You might even have an idea of what Jesus would do. 
In fact, we have the Bible. We know perfectly well, in most cases, what Jesus would do. But if we don't do it, <laughs> then are we a disciple? I mean, we kind of have to do it. Again, this is process. This is process. We're working on this. We need, we desperately need the strength of the Spirit of God, His unfailing love in order for us to even begin to start acting like Jesus. There's no way that we could ever, under our own power, come close to being Christ-like. We need this, which maybe in a sense is a little discouraging because you're like, oh man, what could I ever do? It's also a little encouraging because you're not responsible to do things that you can't do. We don't have to beat ourselves up about not being able to do something that we can't do. We just have to be willing to do it. We have to be willing to trust in God's strength to get it done. I mean, the scriptures tell us this. In our weakness, God's strength is perfected. But we do have to choose it. We do have to say yes to it. To choose, to follow, to be a true disciple, to imitate Christ. And then let God give us the strength. So part of this choosing involves embracing that ethical, virtuous living. Paul, in this letter that he writes to the Colossians, we read this, encourages believers to clothe themselves in virtue. I love that language. But put on these clothes. Clothe yourself in compassion and kindness and humility, and meekness, and patience. Do those characteristics sound familiar to you? Do they fit like a, like a comfortable shirt? Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. He says, be forgiving. You're imitating Christ when you do. Jesus forgave. You should forgive. And above all, he tells them to clothe themselves with love, which binds them all together in perfect harmony. This is great stuff. He's simply listing virtuous, ethical behaviors based on the example of Jesus. This is what Jesus did. This is what you can do. Now, just prior to this, a little bit up, we didn't read that part of the text, but he, he gave us a counterpoint there of vices, impurity, anger, malice, evil desire, wrath, slander, abusive language, okay? And he says, you know, you need to put these things to death. That's really strong language, isn't it? Most of us don't put them to death. We put them in a closet, get them out at the holidays sometimes whenever the family comes over. We chain them up in the backyard. Put it to death, Jesus says, through Paul. Put it to death. We are to avoid these things, not participate in them in any way, shape, or form. And again, we need the Spirit's help here to resist these things, but the Spirit is always there. The Spirit is always present. This is a classic virtue and vice list. This is, this is something that shows up in the literature quite a bit. It, it gives us a similar one in the fifth chapter of Galatians. You know the famous fruit of the Spirit. There's also that corresponding works of the flesh that comes before that. True disciples choose Virtue over vice. True disciples choose compassion and kindness and patience instead of anger and wrath and malice. Again, look at our behavior. Look around. Look at our own lives. Is there more virtue than vice? Is there more love, joy, and peace, as it says in Galatians? Or is there more strife, jealousy, and quarreling? What does our behavior look like? What have we chosen what have we allowed to be formed in us? And these are critical questions. Because this whole spiritual formation process, this whole becoming who God wants us to be, it's not just an academic exercise. At least I hope you're seeing it in something more than that. I mean, yeah, we can read a book. We can study it. We can talk about it. We can reflect on it. And if it dies there, then what was the point? People do sometimes. They set out on these self-improvement journeys uh, with no intention of sharing that improvement with anyone. They're just doing it for themselves. They don't care if anybody sees their paintings or listens to their music or witnesses their physical fitness. And in some ways, that may be okay. 
We probably need to be motivated to be transformed for our own good initially. It's good for us and not just for the attention of others. But when God sets about transforming us into the likeness of Christ, which I assure you is going on right now in each heart that is here, when God sets about this, God has no intention of allowing us to tuck that candle under a basket. When God transforms us, it is for a purpose. There is no hiding that city on a hill. It's never just personal, private self-improvement. There's always a purpose beyond us. We are transformed into the likeness of Christ always for God's glory and our neighbor's good. Ethical behavior would be kind of meaningless otherwise, wouldn't it? It's like if there's nobody to be ethical with... What is it? What is ethical if that's the case? It, it wouldn't really matter. But since it does matter, since we are not alone, since it matters how we behave in this world, then it matters a lot. This ethical behavior that's forged into the likeness of Christ, that is led by that ever-present Spirit of God, that is fueled by that eternal love of the Father, it's critical for the follower of Jesus. Jesus. Because that Christ-like ethical behavior, another way would be saying that we are truly reflecting the image of God, that is the exact way that God intends the world to find out about Jesus. Oh my goodness. I remind myself of this on occasion. I've got it written on my marker board in the office. That the only tool in God's redemptive toolbox is the church. There is no other plan. God has said, I have given you this ministry of reconciliation. I expect you to share the gospel with people. And if you don't do it, where do we stand? I want you to do it, God says. This Christ-like ethical behavior is how people get to know Jesus. They get to know Jesus when we imitate Jesus when people see Christ-like behavior in us and when we claim to be the followers of Jesus and then don't do it and don't show that behavior boy how do we create all kinds of problems for the gospel Paul says this in Romans 2 he says hypocrisy claiming one thing and doing something else hypocrisy causes the name of God to be blasphemed among the Gentiles. We should take it seriously. So here we are. We're putting it all together. We're bringing it into a whole. God loves us. In spite of our less than Christ-like behavior, God still loves us. God loves us. C.S. Lewis put it in a beautiful way in the book, The Four Loves, that he wrote. He said this, God, who needs nothing, loves into existence holy, superfluous creatures. I love that phrase. Completely needless creatures. There's no need for us. Holy, superfluous creatures in order that he may love and perfect them. Oh, man. Doesn't that make you feel good? God looked at you and said, I don't need to make you. I want to make you. I'm going to love you into existence so that I can love you and perfect you. Oh, that's awesome. We are these holy, superfluous creatures. And not just superfluous, not just extraneous, not just needless, but willful and stubborn and selfish to boot. And yet God loves us. God loves us loves us, even when we don't love in return. Even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us so much that before we were even born, God said, I'm going to put my image in you, each one of you, the image of God. You carry that, each of you superfluous creatures. And God loves us enough to say, I'm not just going to put my image in you. I'm not just going to love you. I'm going to give you a reason to exist. 
so that you aren't superfluous. You have a purpose. You have something to do. But we're not going to realize that purpose unless we allow ourselves to be transformed by God's love. We've got to let the Spirit of God into all of the nooks and the crannies in us, all of those dark, shadowy corners and the cupboards and the places that we're hiding from God saying, no, 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 don't go over there. Don't look at that. We've got to let God into all of that so that the Spirit of God can transform every part of us, 100%, into the likeness of Christ. And God can do it, and God will do it, and God is doing it right now in your hearts if we get out of the way. God's love is like that. God's love is like that, ready, able to transform all of those contortions and those corruptions and those malformations in our spirits, in our emotions, in our relationships, in our intellect, in our vocations, in our physical bodies, and even in our stewardship. God wants to fix every part of us. And then once all of those parts are more fully formed into the likeness of Christ, the Spirit pulls it all together as a whole integrated responsive follower of Jesus, doing what Jesus wants us to do, one that is capable of showing the world what it means to live like Jesus. What would Jesus do indeed? And this, sisters and brothers, is who we are meant to be. And it is this spirit who will get us there. Let's pray. Lord, we want this. This is our heart's desire to be who you want us to be. Lord, we don't know all of the implications, the ins and the outs, the sacrifices the hard work, the discipline. We are not fully aware of what we are saying yes to, but that doesn't matter. Because of our faith in you, we know that you have only, only good for us. And so we come willing to offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, willing to be transformed into the likeness of Christ, willing to reject the conformity to the world that is so often pressing on us, willing to get ourselves out of the way and let the Spirit do His work. We are willing, but our flesh is often weak, and so we turn to you for the strength that we need. And we trust that what you are creating in us, you will complete. We pray these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. we are going to go from here and we're going to go into the world to be your witnesses to share with people your love to more fully and accurately reflect what it means to be a follower of Jesus we'll do it a little better today than we did yesterday and hopefully tomorrow you will give us the strength to do it 
even better. Thank you for being with us and guiding us in this moment. Thank you for leading us into a world that needs you. We pray for those that can't be with us who ask that you would cover them with your grace and your mercy. Heal those that are sick in body and we're in spirit. And Lord, we look forward to gathering again to be in your presence and the presence of sisters and brothers. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So it was not 15 minutes. You may go in peace. <laughs>